Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Behari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Behari Gopi Janabalaba Kirin Bharathari Gopi Janabalaba Kirin Bharathari Yasur Nandana Braja Janaranjana Yamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jaim Shivam Zabaraj Gita Stote Sati Sisi Mare Si Bhakti Vedanta Samyaraj Sri Prabhupada Jaim Shivam Zabaraj Gita Stote Sati Sisi Mare Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasri Dhaka Prabhupada 
गौ प्रेम ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Shrimad Bhagavatam Canto 3 Chapter 16 Jaya and Vijaya cursed by the sages Text 17 Brahman yasya param daivam Brahmana kilate prabho Vipranam deva devanam भगवान्म दमन्य परम द्राह्मणा किल ते प्रभो विभ्राण देवदेवा भगवान्म द्रमण्य परम द ब्राह्मणाकिलते प्रभो विभ्राण देवदेवा भगवान्म दैवत Vaishnavis Brahmanyasya of the supreme director of the brahminical culture param the highest daivam position brahmana the brahmanas kila for the teaching of others te your prabhu o lord vipranam of the brahmanas deva devanam to be worshiped by the demigods bhagavan the supreme personality of godhead atma the self daivatam worshipable deity translation these are the four kumaras speaking to the supreme personality of godhead o lord You are the supreme director of the Brahminical culture. Your considering the Brahmanas to be in the highest position is your example for teaching others. Actually, you are the supreme worshipable deity, and not only for the gods but for the Brahmanas also. Purport. In the Brahma Samhita, it is clearly stated that the supreme personality of God it is the cause of all causes. There are undoubtedly many demigods, the chiefs of whom are Brahma and Shiva. 
Lord Vishnu is the Lord of Brahma and Shiva, not to speak of the Brahmanas in this material world. As mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Lord is very favorable towards all activities performed according to Brahminical culture or the qualities of control of the senses and mind, cleanliness, forbearance, faith in scripture, and practical and theoretical knowledge. The Lord is the super soul of everyone. In Bhagavad Gita, it is said that the Lord is the source of all emanations. Thus, he is also the source of Brahma and Shiva. Translation again. O Lord, you are the supreme director of the Brahminical culture. You are considering the Brahmanas to be in the highest position is your example for teaching others. Actually, you are the supreme worshipable deity, not only for the gods, but for the Brahmanas also. Om Ajnana Chimadandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshun Militang Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare the four Kumaras are responding like this to the Supreme Personality of Godhead because you've heard many verses spoken by the Lord about how the Brahmanas are the everything. And in the purports, Srila Prabhupada explains that the devotee thinks that the devotee has good qualities just because of service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead Whereas the Supreme Personality of Godhead thinks that he has divine qualities only because of his affection and service to the devotees. So we're really getting a sense of reciprocation in this chapter. A reciprocation so extensive that the Lord tells the Kumaras that if any part of me offends the Brahmanas, I'll cut off that limb that causes such offensive behavior. So the Kumaras are hearing all this and their first reaction upon this whole situation when the Lord appears and speaks to them, their first reaction is they're not sure what's really going on. <laughs> they're wondering, are the Lord's praises of the Brahmanas implicitly praising the four Kumars, is this the prelude before the Lord chastises us? <laughs> They're feeling that maybe we made a mistake in cursing these gatekeepers. These gatekeepers are dear to the Lord, they have love for the Lord, and we curse them. Maybe we're gonna catch it. <laughs> and maybe The curse will be nullified by the Lord. Maybe it won't. Maybe the Lord will show the gatekeepers his mercy. Maybe he'll curse us. Maybe he'll take action against us because we actually cursed his beloved associates. So the Kumaras are not sure what kind of ground they're standing on. And then they hear all these praises by the Supreme Lord uh, of the Brahmanas. And we can take that to heart especially in this day and age when there is no wisdom culture in the world. People do not value wisdom. They value commercial knowledge, technological knowledge, but for the reestablishment of a wisdom culture, they depend on the devotees of Lord Krishna, what we're doing right now. People are bewildered by environmental problems, the nuclear warfare issue is right on the table again. There's no nuclear treaty right now between the USA and Russia. It's all scrapped. Everyone's building up, building up, building up. <laughs> they have the capacity, the nuclear capacity to destroy the earth several times over, but still they want to build up more, more, more. <laughs> what does Krishna say in the 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita? Shayaya Jagatohita. Their business is simply how to destroy the world. This is their mentality. 
So where is the wisdom coming from? Where is the knowledge coming from? Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, in his expansion, Vaikuntha expansion, is highlighting why he worships the Brahmanas. Because without a Brahmana head on the social body, you have chaos, as you have today. What holds the world together today is simply commerce. <laughs> no higher principles, no higher understanding, no real religion at all. As we are hearing Swavas Prabhu read from a very memorable, of course, it's, all of Bhagavatam is memorable, but in terms of our situation today, it was very memorable. How Prabhupada points out that there's no sattva guna, no mode of goodness culture, and that means there's no process for clearing the heart of the bodily conception of life. And as long as the bodily conception of life is there in the heart, there can be no peace. There can be no real progress. People are so hung up on their identity. It's a big thing these days to have some kind of identity, have multiple bodily identities and cling to them. The more upadis, the more material designations you have, the better. <laughs> I was thinking of one devotee. He spent time here in Los Angeles. Now he's preaching at State College, Pennsylvania, where the University of Penn State is 50,000 students in a town of 125,000, including the students. So the students are so fascinated by putting forth an upadi, a designation. I'm this gender orientation. I'm that gender orientation. I'm of this group, ethnicity. I'm of that ethnicity. These become a source of pride and a source of so-called internal stability. So immediately, the student brandishes his or her or in between identity. I'm a this, by the way. And, and then you, you must offer pranams, otherwise you're in trouble. <laughs> so Yasudeva Prabhu outdoes them. He says, well, you know, my mother is African-American and Navajo Indian. My father is Syrian. My wife is a German Kazakh who speaks Russian. I think, wow. <laughs> You've got so many identities. How fortunate you are. <laughs> so what is this material identity? This is what happens when there's no Brahmana head on the social body. You cling to five things. Class, color, creed, culture, country. Anyone, and the more the better, becomes such a powerful reality in your heart. I'm of this class. I'm of this creed. I'm, this is my color. Uh, this is my country. This is my culture. All these things can change easily and do change. Yet people cling to them as this quintet. They cling to this quintet as a source of stability in their life. And then they get manipulated by politicians. The process for manipulation is twofold. First, you have to create a strong material identity over something in the people. This is what nationalism is based on. This is what ethnicity is based on. Now it's even gender roles, gender identities. Make the people believe in some kind of material identity so strongly that they feel they're deriving a sense of strength from that. I am a this. <laughs> That's only half the process, though. The other half is they have to feel that someone, some group is threatening their strong upadi, their bodily designation. You have to identify a threat if you want to activate them for your own purposes. Otherwise, if they simply have a strong material identity, but there's no identifiable threat to that identity, you don't 
you're not able to stir them into action. There would just be an anxiety. Our group is, I don't know, it's not like it used to be. We're not as strong or rich or powerful as we used to be. What's causing it? We don't know. That will mean just anxiety and no action. But if you want the strong core material identity to be activated so you can manipulate them, you have to identify a threat. You are being diminished. Your group is being diminished because of X, Y, Z. <laughs> and then the people get, ah! <laughs> then they get angry. Once you identify the threat, they get angry, and then you can manipulate them very easily. But if they're just anxiety-stricken, with they haven't identified the threat to their group, they're not so susceptible to manipulation. So you've got to identify a threat. So this is life without a Brahmin ahead on the social body. So as we heard this morning, as long as people are identifying with their creed, which has nothing to do with the real Dharma of surrender to Krishna, as long as I, they identify with their creed, I'm a, I'm a Hindu, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, but know nothing about what is the essence of religion, how can they make any progress? And then uh, combine that with, I am this nationality, I am that nationality. As we said, the more upadis, the more designations that people have these days, the more successful they feel. And you should know all of my upadis, all my designations, and respect each one of them. If you offend any one of my upadis, class, color, creed, country, culture, you're finished. <laughs> so this is life without a Brahmin ahead on the social body. So where are you going to find the Brahmin ahead? This was Prabhupada's plan to develop a wisdom culture based on his books based on the lifestyle of devotees. Show the world what it's like to have sanity. So this is why the Supreme Personality of God is stressing to the four Kumaras. You are Brahmanas. You have been offended by these gatekeepers. That's as good as my offending you because these gatekeepers are my assistants. So if the assistance of the leader caused some harm, that's as good as the leader himself causing harm. So I have to take some of the blame. So much so that if I think that anything about me has harmed the brahmanas, I would cut off that limb that does such offenses. So these are very strong statements. But underneath it all, there are some hints that you Kumaras went over the top. <laughs> you went too far. And the Kumaras know it, that embedded in all this praise is some chastisement. We don't know how intense that ch chastisement uh, or disapproval is. So they're asking for clarification. They were overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord who actually came there along with the goddess of fortune. They were overwhelmed, but at the same time, the words spoken by the Supreme Personality God, and the Kumaras couldn't exactly understand. And why couldn't they exactly understand? Because of the anger that still lingered in their consciousness upon their cursing Jai and Vijay. They couldn't really understand what was, what is the, what's the Lord actually meaning? Are we wrong? Are the gatekeepers wrong? It can't be that the Supreme Lord is wrong. Even though the Supreme Lord himself presented that, maybe I've done something bad because these are my assistants, but the Kumaras couldn't swallow that. So they were just bewildered a bit, but expressing their bewilderment in a very profound way. We get, so many devotees get bewildered by this chapter because there are things in the purports that are beyond our 
thinking which is restricted by time and space. So there purports where Prabhupada writes that even in Vaikuntha you can commit an offense, but in Vaikuntha the Supreme Lord saves the devotees from reactions to the offense, even though in Vaikuntha you can commit an offense. That sounds astonishing. And then also in the purports, he writes that no one can fall from Vaikuntha this is an accident. This falling of Jai and Vijay is an accident. Other places he l approaches a situation from another angle. The fall of Jai and Vijay shows that it's possible to leave the spiritual world. So devotees seize upon one statement or another and they <laughs> form a various theological parties and denominations. It was like this. Oh, it is like that. <laughs> The situation is beyond time and space. That's the conclusion that Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, who basically repeats the same conclusion of Srila Prabhupada. Or Srila Prabhupada repeats the same conclusion of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, that what's the use in arguing about this? This is beyond your comprehension. In fact, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, because this is beyond, this has nothing to do with time and space. The f how the jiva got to the material world. There's no point in you arguing about it, otherwise anartas will develop in you. And we see that happening. Devotees get angry at another devotee. Ah, oh, you, you, you think this, you think I'm wrong, and on and on and on it goes. So there are things in the Bhagavatam that cannot be resolved just with our ordinary understanding because our thinking process is constricted by time and space. And when you're dealing with the spiritual world, there's no time, there's no, there's no material time, there's no material space. So what is to be done? I've heard on morning walks directly, devotees would ask, well, Prabhupada, in Bhagavad Gita, it is said, once having gone to the spiritual world, you never return. And Prabhupada replied that, yes, you, you, once having been burned, you're never going to stick your fingers in the fire again. But if you want to return, you can. <laughs> so how do you add all that up? You can add it all up. <laughs> so this chapter can be very bewildering, uh, if not approached with a humble attitude. The main thing is that Jai and Vijay, they want to experience Krishna's battling the demons in the material world. They can't do that in Vaikuntha. Somehow or other, they wind up in the material world. And each successive appearance as demons, first as Haranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha, then as Ravana and Kumbhakarna, and finally, as Shishupal and Dantavakra, with each appearance, their attraction for Krishna comes out more and more in the form of personal hatred of Krishna. But that is attachment also. So the Rupa Goswami points out, as I've said before here, in the, you have the BBT version of Lagu Bhagavatamrita. Rupa Goswami gets right into it. The first appearance as Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu, uh, when they were killed by the Lord, they didn't really understand what was happening. They thought they're battling some kind of extraordinarily powerful creature never seen before. <laughs> Varaha, Lord Boar, mm, Nasringadev, half man, half lion. What is this? What is this? <laughs> Must be some creature that's performed a lot of pious activities and, and has assumed such a form. No understanding that this is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then Ravana and Kumakarna. Ra Ravana was so focused on Sita's beauty. He wasn't thinking so much about Ram other than Ram is the husband of this woman I want. <laughs> that was his God realization, <laughs> basically none. <laughs> so when he's killed 
by Lord Ram, he's got no understanding, no theistic understanding or realization whatsoever. But each time they're killed by the Lord in one of his incarnations, the these giant Vijay in their demoniac existence develop more and more of a personal understanding. It starts off zero and then starts to increase. By the time they are Shishupal and Dantavakra, their hatred of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is personal and full-blown. We can't stand that beautiful <laughs> blank, blank, blank. <laughs> We can stand his names. What, call him what you like. Pundari Kaksha, call him this Garuda Vahana, whatever, get whatever holy name you give to him. And we, we know them all. We recite them all. We can't stand it. <laughs> so as you know, Shishupal was blaspheming Krishna even before, even as a baby, before he could talk straight. He was blaspheming Krishna. And therefore, the Lord's form and name entered the heart of Shishupal. Even though his reaction is so negative, it's personal. This is why Narada Muni in the seventh canto of Bhagavatam says that, oh, if I could only love Krishna with the intensity that these special demons hated him, oh, if I could only do that. So it's the intensity of the personal hatred. Not like, what's his name? Maharaj Vena, who had no personal understanding at all of, of the Supreme Lord. And so therefore, he didn't get any benefit upon being killed. But Jai and Vijay, each time they were killed, they started to gain in understanding reviving their understanding that they're dealing with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So they played the role perfectly. It's not a question of they're assuming a nature. They were the nature. Asarika Bhava, we hate Krishna. <laughs> Remember Dantavakra, after the death of Shishupal, Dantavakra marching towards Krishna with such steps that the whole earth is shaking. And, he, and both Shishupal and Dandavakra were related in an extensive kinship system. They were related to Krishna. They had that good fortune in, their, in Jaya and Vijaya's third, uh, third appearance, third birth. They, they had the good, afford, the good fortune to be related in an, ex, in an extensive kinship system with Krishna. So Dantavakra is marching towards Krishna. Krishna, you're my cousin. I shouldn't have to kill you. <laughs> He's really feeling the demoniac Baba. He's not faking it. And this is what gives the Supreme Lord such pleasure. He's got some real opponents to battle. He can't do that in Vaikuntha. <laughs> so in this way, the Lord is telling the four Kumaras, all right, you cursed them. Okay, you, actually you did that on behalf of me. In other words, I would have done the same thing, but you did it. All right, all right. Send them back to Vaikuntha as soon as possible. So therefore, the three births, and then they came back. So this is a very extraordinary situation, and we shouldn't grab one statement in one purport and say this is opposite what it says in another purport or what another acharya says or this, that, the other. You're dealing with something that has no origin in time and space. So I recommend Bhakti Vinod Thakur's response, which is what Prabhupada is repeating to us. Don't think you can sort all this out. Why create animosity about it? As Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, those who try to argue one side or the other, they simply create anartas, unwanted things in the heart. What the Kumaras are saying to the Supreme Lord 
is very essential because they're, they're pointing out Brahmanas are so necessary for society. And as Prabhupada points out in one purport, they're not referring to caste Brahmanas. They are referring to Brahmanas who have the guna and karma, the quality of a Brahmana and the activities of the Brahmana. Without them, how can there actually be human progress? Any questions? Yes, Bregupati Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for yet another wonderful class. Um, my question is on the point of um, that you made about Narada Muni. He's praying in the Bhagavatam that he wishes he could have the uh, love Krishna with the intensity that Sisupal and Dantavakra hated him. So this is a point for philosophical appreciation, correct? It has no practical application. It has practical application. Narada Muni is noting the bhava of these demons, these special demons is so intense. That's for real. And he's saying if my own bhava could only be that strong. That's the practical application. But in the life of a devotee, say, let's like say a devotee is going through rough times and he's feeling, why is Krishna doing this to me? And he thinks, well, I can indulge this mood because it's okay. You know, in the Bhagavatam, it says how you can feel these negative feelings towards Krishna. And that's also, you know, like. Now, Rupa Goswami, and we're all Rupa Nuga, says, Anu Kuyena Krishna Anu Shilanam, favorable devotional service. These demons were unfavorable. So Narada Muni is not recommending that you develop a hatred attitude toward Krishna because other demons have shown the intensity of such an attitude. He's saying just take note of that and develop a more intense, favorable attitude. But Narada Muni is showing you how a devotee can take inspiration from anything in his quest to love Krishna and serve Krishna better. Look at these demons, they hate him so much. Oh, if I could only love him so much. <laughs> This is how expansive and, all, and comprehensive bhakti is. We look at the achievements of great sports stars, leaders of nations, temporary though they be, and we, and we can see that they have abilities. And those abilities ultimately come from Krishna. And we think, if only I could serve Krishna, Krishna with that expertise that they're serving Maya. <laughs> we were speaking last night about the cowherd boys playing with Krishna, how Krishna is known as mm, Viraha Vit. No. Viha, excuse me, Vihara Vit, the master of games. And he's also known as Vinoda Kovida, the master of sports. So it's all there in Krishna. He's the best. <laughs> so whatever it, it, tiny fragment of empowerment you see in some mundane hero, mundane star, mundane leader, that's nothing to compare to what's there in Krishna and Krishna Leela. So we like sports. We like games. Let's be there with the cowherd boys playing hide and seek and cops and robbers in the Vrindavan forest. Anything else? <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Uh, thank you for wonderful class, Maharaj. Uh, I just had one qu quick question, and that is, you uh, contrasted the caste Brahmins with the non-caste Brahmins. So would you be so kind as to let us know what are the qualities of these caste Brahmins and what are the differing qualities of the non-caste Brahmins who act in a more favorable way in, in terms of devotional service? Caste Brahmanas do not base their qualification generally on their activities and qualities. They take pride in their birth. If, if the parents are, are known as in the Brahmana caste, 
then the children are of that caste, which is ridiculous as saying, because my father is a lawyer, therefore I am a qualified lawyer. <laughs> there are some caste brahmanas who have mode of goodness qualifications, but they're not Vaishnavas. And then there are brahmanas, caste or not, that are Vaishnavas. Some Vaishnavas are actually born in a genuine Brahmana family. So the basic problem is those who put themselves forward as Brahmanas simply because of birthright. This is what the Acharyas are completely against. And Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur made such a heroic battle against such misunderstanding, his life was even threatened. So that's why Prabhupada in a Nectar of Devotion points out it was a great battle waged by Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur. Yes. And that is what you're saying is that these caste Brahmins were more concerned with their appearance, what they looked like, what they presented themselves as, as opposed to what they actually were, as opposed to the substance, as opposed to the um, uh, that which is uh, necessary for true devotional life to take place. So there's a difference between those two, appearance and substance. For caste brahmanas, appearance is everything. Just look at the family I was born in. Don't look at my qualifications. Don't look at my activities. Still, there are some caste brahmanas who actually cultivate a mode of goodness lifestyle. From the Vaishnava point of view, we just look and see where is the Krishna bhakti. No matter what family you're born in, we want to see how are you engaged in Krishna's service. That's the difference. So thank you, Maharaj, for the nice presentation. I was reflecting about the identity problem that you started from the beginning. And <clears throat> we see that in the world right now, the politicians are trying to fight and find the issue how to settle down, but they can't. They have to I don't find some mediation so they don't get affected in their votes and like that. So we do have actually, from our side, from the Vaishnava philosophy, we have the solution to all those problems. Yet, we find sometimes that even among our Vaishnava practitioners, we deal with the issue of identity when it comes, for example, let's say the women guru issue. And then it's like, What's going on? <laughs> so the point is that we do have it and we can teach to the world and it will be easy for other people maybe to understand if they see the perfect example. But where it looks like we're lacking in that respect. Can you comment something? I think you've already made your comment. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, thank you for a wonderful class. Um, uh, it's no mystery that um, to conquer an, uh, an army, uh, it's no mystery that a good way to do that is to divide it. Um, do you think these divisions that we're experiencing, like philosophically, is a energy trying to defeat or foil the Sankirtan movement? To some degree, yes. The more devotees argue with one another, the less Sankirtan they're doing. <laughs> That's a basic practical fact. And the more they're doing Sankirtan, the less time they have for divide and conquer, arguing and fighting, you're thinking about how to give Krishna to others, how to give them this book, how to give them a full set. Why just one book? Now you're doing stacks of books. Why just a stack of books? Now full sets. Isn't that enough to occupy the intelligence? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.